Hey guys and welcome back for another episode in my midweek mystery series where today I have a historic case for you. It's definitely been a minute since I've delved into a historic true crime case and this is one that I've had people requesting for years. This is the story of Jesse Pomeroy, the youngest person ever convicted of first degree murder in Massachusetts and probably America's youngest serial killer in recorded history. Although it's widely considered that he had many, many more victims, it was only ever confirmed that he had two. So the title of serial killer in this case is dubious, but it is thought that he had many more victims. Jesse Pomeroy was just 14 years old at the time of his conviction. Also, the research for this case was fascinating because there's an actual autobiography of Jesse Pomeroy written, obviously, by himself whilst he was imprisoned. Something like that is honestly a jackpot, gold mine in this line of work. However, being that Jesse's version of events is basically that he didn't do any of the things he was accused of, and if he did do it, he only did it because he was insane, is not the most reliable of narratives. That being said, it's one of the only narratives we have in this case, especially when it comes to his childhood. And as I'm saying that, I'm realising that this whole case is his childhood because he was just 14. This is ever the problem with historical stories such as this one. Things just weren't documented as they are nowadays. And if they were, a lot of it has been lost to centuries. The autobiography of Jesse H. Pomeroy first appeared in the Boston Sunday Times across a span of two weeks in July 1875. It was written after he'd been convicted of first degree murder, but he was waiting to hear whether or not he would be facing the gallows, the death penalty. This was his last ditch attempt to save his own life. He's arguing his side of the story. But before we get on with the rest of the video, I want to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring us this week, the documentary streaming service. I'm sure you've all already heard why I love Magellan TV so much over the years. They sponsored me for a very long time. So instead of listing all the reasons, I'm going to jump straight in and tell you about a documentary that I watched recently and I just loved. It's just been released on the platform, it's a new release, it's Sleepwalkers Who Kill. I feel like the premise of this documentary is quite self-explanatory by the title, but it basically takes a look at a rare medical condition that can turn ordinary people into unwitting killers. The documentary features interviews with psychologists and actual people who've committed crimes in their sleep, and I must say this has unlocked a new fear for me because I've never been worried about committing crimes in my sleep before, but here, now I am. But how do you separate the people who are genuinely sleepwalking and committing crimes, because that does happen, from the people who are just pretending and using it as their alibi of sorts? This documentary dives into all of that, it is so interesting. If you want to try out Magellan TV for yourself and watch Sleepwalkers Who Kill, then you can click on the link in the description box to claim your one month free trial. They have so many true crime and history and science and everything documentaries, all the documentaries you could dream of. Jesse Harding Pomeroy was born on the 29th of November 1859 in Charlestown, Massachusetts to his parents Thomas Pomeroy and Ruth Pomeroy. Jesse writes in his autobiography that he has no recollection of the earliest years of his life. He doesn't really remember anything until his 7th or 8th birthday, from which time he has a pretty clear memory. He had an older brother called Charles, Charlie, and their childhood was fairly standard for the time. The brothers got on very well, although they did have their standard brotherly arguments. Charlie and Jesse played baseball and they fished together. They just did the standard activities of the time. The family travelled around quite a lot when Jesse was young, but they eventually settled in Chelsea in Boston. In his autobiography, Jesse writes of a time when it became clear to him that he wasn't quite like other people, he wasn't like the other kids. Him and Charlie were out fishing one day, and as Charlie went to throw the line out, the hook caught Jesse's face, burying itself just underneath his left eye. They went to the doctor, who took the hook out of his face, no problem, it wasn't a serious injury, but Jesse writes that, though the pain was great and hurt very much, I did not show any feeling at all, either when it was in there or when the doctor was taking it out. It might furnish a clue as to why I do not show any feeling now in regard to this case. Basically, Jesse didn't show any outward emotion. But life hadn't really been easy for him up to this point. Ever since Jesse was a baby, his right eye had been milky white, it had no colour, like there was this film over the top of it. 
There's conflicting reasons as to why this is, what caused it. Some say it was due to cataracts, some say it was a viral infection, some say it was a side effect of the smallpox vaccine. But it made him quite jarring to look at, and I guess this made him a target for bullies, who would make fun of his appearance. In later newspaper articles, it'd be written that this evil eye was a sign of things to come. But his eye wasn't the only thing that set him apart from the other kids. Jesse Pomeroy was also said to have had a disproportionately large head, with large features that looked out of place even on the sides of his head, and he was much, much taller and thinner than his peers. He just always looked out of place. But in fact, Jesse looked so unusual that the story goes that even his father struggled to accept him, never being able to look him in the eye without shuddering. But just overall, it seems like his father, Thomas Pomeroy, may have been quite abusive. He had a mean temper once he'd had a drink. An article by Mark Ribbon states how when Jesse would skip school, which he did quite a lot because he was quite naughty, his father would use a horse whip on him, and he'd often strip his sons naked for their punishments, which were always beatings. And this has led to question as to whether this created a link between sex and punishment for a young Jesse. It's said that sometimes Thomas would beat Jesse and Charlie with a switch until they bled. But Jesse was always a challenging child, to say the least. By the age of around 10, he'd already displayed factors of the McDonald triad, an idea that basically posits there are three actions that can indicate whether somebody will grow up to be a serial killer or just generally a very violent adult. The three factors in this theory are cruelty to animal, anoresis, which is bedwetting after the age of five, and arson. According to his mother's later testimony at trial, when Jesse was 10 years old, pets, cats, started to disappear from around his neighbourhood. The mutilated bodies of birds were found scattered on the streets. I don't know whether Jesse was a bedwetter or was ever known for starting fires, and the idea of the McDonald triad wouldn't come round for over a century after this, but it's well known that many serial killers displayed intense violence towards animals in their early years. There's a book by an author called Harold Schechter about Jesse Pomeroy. It's entitled Fiend, The Shocking Story of America's Youngest Serial Killer, and it's pretty much the only extensive look at Jesse's story. Schechter writes about how the Pomeroy family was unable to keep pets in their home. Ruth really wanted lovebirds to brighten up the house, it was a very popular pet at the time, but she was always hesitant because of her son, she knew about his violent streak. Perhaps Jesse was always inclined towards violence, perhaps he was always going to end up doing the things he did, or perhaps violent beatings from his abusive alcoholic father pushed him over the edge. Maybe Jesse didn't know anything but violence, but neither did his brother Charlie, and Charlie didn't do any of the things Jesse did. Jesse would never choose to socialise with the other kids. He wouldn't join in on games of baseball, he wouldn't go swimming or join in with their imaginative play. One account says he would sit on the grass with his eyes cast down, just stabbing the ground repeatedly with a knife. In his autobiography, Jesse would admit to being a troublemaker in the years previously, saying that he lit firecrackers at school, leading to punishment from his teacher, and he liked to get up to mischief, but he would fall short of admitting to any actual crimes in this writing. Crimes that began in 1871 with his first victim, four-year-old William Payne. It was around Christmas Day when two men were walking near a small cabin on Powderhorn Hill near the Chelsea Creek in South Boston. From the cabin they hear a quiet cry, so the men go to investigate and inside they find a small child in a horrifying situation. If you haven't gathered that this case involves discussion of crimes committed against and committed by children yet, here's your warning. Little Billy Payne was hanging from the centre beam of this cabin by a rope tied to his wrists. He was unconscious and half naked, and it was December, he was freezing cold, white skinned and blue lipped. Billy had been beaten severely over his back, he was covered in painful red welts, split open. The only information the two men were able to get out of Billy was his name, and from there they managed to find his parents and his home, returning him back there, and the police were notified. Once recovered, Billy wasn't able to share much information though about his attacker. It was probably assumed at the time that this was a one-off, that whoever did this to Billy wouldn't attack again. If that was the case, if they did think that, they were wrong. Two months later, in February 1872, seven-year-old Tracy Hayden was attacked. 
For the sake of clarity, although Tracy is generally a feminine name nowadays, it has traditionally been a masculine name. Tracy was a seven-year-old boy. He'd been lured to an abandoned outhouse, the same outhouse from the previous attack, by an older boy and brutally attacked. When he returned home, he had swollen eyes, a broken nose and split lip, along with two missing front teeth. When the police arrived to take his statement, he said that he'd been approached by a big boy with brown hair whilst he'd been playing in the street, and the boy had asked him if he wanted to go to Powderhorn Hill to see the soldiers. He agreed he wanted to see the soldiers, and when they arrived, the boy had tripped him up, put a handkerchief in his mouth before tying up his feet and hands, and then tying him to the beam. Tracy was whipped with a hard stick, and then the attacker threatened to cut Tracy's penis off. He didn't, but he threatened to. Based on Tracy's vague description of the attacker, the authorities had a hard time identifying him. Fast forward a couple more months to May 20th, 1872, with eight-year-old Robert Mayer. As with the previous victims, Robert was approached by an older, brown-haired boy who asked him if he wanted to go see Barnum Circus. Of course, Robert agreed, so he was led towards Powderhorn Hill. As they walked there, they walked next to a pond, and Robert said the boy tried to push him in, but he managed to pull away. He wasn't quick enough to escape though, and he was soon dragged towards a house where his clothing was stripped off, and he was tied to a post with a length of clothesline, before being whipped by his now laughing attacker. The boy forced Robert to say bad words, seeming to revel in it, for he then masturbated in front of him and then let him go. Of course, by this point, people all across Chelsea were aware of the attacks that had been happening. The police were actively trying to apprehend the boy responsible, questioning hundreds of boys, but they never had much luck. All of the victims were so traumatised and they were literal children, they hadn't been focusing on trying to remember details of their attacker, the most they could give was just this vague description, brown hair, tall. The local papers referred to the perpetrator as an inhuman scamp. Young boys were warned not to talk to strangers in a world where everyone chatted to everyone. Children would usually leave their homes in the morning and not be seen again till sunset. But now the whole community was on the lookout for this satanic youth. But nobody really noticed Jesse Pomeroy, not yet anyway. It was a couple of months after the attack on Robert Mayer that Ruth Pomeroy threw her husband Thomas out of the house. Fed up with his drinking and his temper, she no longer wanted him around the kids. And in what seems to be a messed up emotional response, two days later on the 22nd of July 1872, seven-year-old Johnny Bulk becomes the next victim. Now Johnny had been warned by his parents for many months to watch out for this person who was hurting young boys, but through word of mouth, urban legend, description of this perpetrator had turned into a grown up man with red hair and a beard, a strange personification of the devil. The attacker, who we now know was Jesse, was not red headed, nor did he have a beard, and he was a kid. He was fine to talk to, Johnny thought, when Jesse approached him as he was window shopping at a local toy store. Under the guise of earning some money so he could buy the toys, Jesse told Johnny to follow him, leading him, of course, to the small wooden cabin on Powderhorn Hill. I don't need to detail what happened once we got there, we know the gist of it by this point. But it was very clear by now that Jesse was receiving sexual satisfaction through these attacks. Not long after this, at the beginning of August, Ruth packed up her two sons and they moved from Chelsea to another area in South Boston. We don't know exactly why she did this, either because she'd kicked her husband out and needed a cheaper place to live, or she just wanted a fresh start. Or maybe she'd been reading about the attacks on local children and she had her suspicions about Jesse. We know that she already didn't trust him around animals. Maybe she thought that if they moved away, suspicions wouldn't ever fall on him. But of course, the attacks just continued in their new community. If Ruth didn't already have her suspicions, I'm sure she would have done then. Just two weeks after they moved, seven-year-old George Pratt was abducted and taken to an abandoned boathouse and attacked. This time the attack was even more brutal, with chunks of his flesh bitten from his body. On September 5th, six-year-old Harry Austin was stabbed and attempts were made to cut off his penis. Less than a week later, six-year-old Joseph Kennedy was slashed with a knife and then salt water was rubbed into the wounds for no reason other than to cause more intense pain, literally rubbing salt in the wound. The attacks were also ramping up with less and less time between each one. 
On Tuesday the 17th September, three railroad workers came across the naked body of a five-year-old boy who they later found out was Robert Gold. Despite the bad way Robert was found, he did manage to survive. His scalp had been slashed and he was covered in blood, but it was this little five-year-old boy who was able to finally give police a more helpful description of his attacker, describing a big bad boy with a funny eye. When asked to elaborate, he described how his attacker had an eye like a milky, a term for a marble that was all white. This was picked up on very quickly by the media who started talking about the boy with the marble eye. As you can imagine, there aren't many people out there who match a description like this, so Jesse Pomeroy's time was limited from here on out. In fact, from there, it took the police just three days to track him down. The police had wanted Robert Gold to come with them to some local school to see if he could identify any of the boys sitting in the classrooms, but Robert was in a bad way, his scalp wound needed stitches, and his parents didn't really want him to go, so instead the police take another victim, Joseph Kennedy, instead. However, despite walking into Jesse's classroom, Joseph Kennedy failed to identify him. But then, Jesse messed up. That day, after school, for some strange reason, Jesse went to the police station. When he saw Joseph Kennedy there, he quickly turned around and left, but a policeman had noticed him and wondered what he was doing, and he grabbed him as he walked back down the street. Dragging him back to the station, he stood face to face with Joseph, who immediately recognised him, saying that he had the same eyes as his attacker. Jesse, of course, immediately denied this accusation, crying as he was thrown into a jail cell. And then two officers went to tell Ruth that her son was under arrest, and she also denied that her son could have been the one responsible. He was a good boy, she said, obedient, hardworking, as well as just being way too young to commit such crimes. At this point, he was just 12 years old, although he probably would have looked much older because of his height and just general physique. The police refused to let Ruth see her son in the cell. At midnight, the two officers woke Jesse up who started sobbing again and explained that unless he confessed to the crimes, he was going to end up in prison for a hundred years. Finally, Jesse admitted to being the boy torturer and early in the morning he was paraded in front of a number of his victims who all recognised him and confirmed that the identification was indeed correct. That same afternoon, he was arraigned with five of his victims testifying against him and Jesse was called to the stand himself. When asked why he committed the crimes, he said that he just couldn't help himself. After a brief consult with the judge, his sentence was hand down. Now, trials back then were not like they are today with months and months and months of preparation. This all happened in literally 24 hours. The sentence was as follows. Jesse was to be confirmed to the House of Reformation, a reform house for unruly children essentially, until he turned 18 years old, so six years away. However, Jesse did not spend his whole sentence. Once in the House of Reformation, he quickly adapted to this new way of life. And one thing that is worth noting about Jesse is that he was not stupid. I can imagine a lot of people probably would have treated him as so, seeing as his appearance othered him, and the fact that he was a troublemaker. But he was 12 years old, committing crimes and hiding from the police. He knew what he wanted to do and how to do it. He knew how to read people to get them to do his bidding. So, once in the reform house, he knew that if he wanted to be free, he had to conform. He had to behave himself, and he did his work, he studied, he made friends, and generally just showed a lot of growth. Although, he did show a weird amount of interest in the other inmates' crimes, always wanting to know how and why they ended up in the house with him. There was also this strange event where he was asked by a teacher to help kill a snake, I assume it got into the house or the grounds or something, and he worked himself into an absolute frenzy, beating the snake to death. But you know, other than that, he was showing great promise, he was doing really well. On the outside, as most parents would, Ruth was also fighting endlessly for her son's release, still refusing to believe that he was the one responsible. She wrote so many letters to the authorities fighting his case. Eventually, on the 24th of January 1874, after just 17 months, 13-year-old Jesse was set free on probation. He wouldn't re-offend, surely, not with the eyes of the authorities on him now, and he'd learned his lesson. He was now 13 years old, he was older, he was wiser. It was all going to be fine. Except, of course, it wasn't. Less than six weeks after his release, Jesse re-offends. 
On the 18th of March 1874, 10-year-old Katie Mary Curran comes into the store owned by Ruth, looking to purchase a notebook for school. In the store is Jessie and an errands boy, and Katie explains to them how she's already been to one store nearby and they were out of stock. Do they have any notebooks? Jessie says that yes, he does have one notebook in stock, but it does have an ink spot on the cover. He'll give her a discount. He sends the errand boy off to the butchers before telling Katie there was a store downstairs. They can go and look together. The use of the word store here is very interesting because there wasn't a store, it was simply a basement. Had Jesse told Katie to come down to the basement with him, she probably would have hesitated and he knew that. Using the word store made her much more likely to follow him. Once they got downstairs, Katie was confused. Of course, there was no store. But before she could figure out what was going on, Jesse came up behind her and cut her throat. She died almost instantly and in his later confession, he would say that he then just dragged her behind the water closet, covered her body with some stones and ashes and that was that. But there was actually much more to the story. When her body was eventually found, it was found that Katie's head was completely severed and her dress and undergarments had been sliced open in the front. She was too decomposed for them to figure out what other injuries she may have obtained, although it seemed that her abdomen and her genitals had been savaged. Katie was expected home by her mother that morning by 8.30am and when she didn't arrive, her mother immediately started to panic. Mary Curran, Katie's mum, went to the police but she was just brushed off, with them saying that Katie had probably got lost and be home within a day. It's nice to see the police haven't changed in the last couple of centuries, just a runaway. But the story of Jesse Pomeroy wasn't far from people's minds and people knew that he had been released recently, despite protests from the local community. Jessie's name first came up in relation with Katie's disappearance when Mary went to Tobin's general store where Katie had originally been going to buy her notebook. But Tobin told Mary that he had sold out and he'd sent Katie over to the Pomeroy store. As you can imagine, Mary's heart sank. And then later the errand boy came forward to say that Katie had definitely gone into store and spoken to him and Jessie. When Mary took this information to the police, they said that the errand boy was a known liar and not to take anything he said seriously. But a detective was sent round the shop to look. The detective didn't find anything, but then again, he didn't go into the basement. The police refused to believe that Jesse could have been the one responsible, possibly a bit of denial on their behalves. They said that he'd been reformed, the school had been successful, and besides, Jesse only ever attacked little boys, never little girls. The police did question Jessie eventually, but they found nothing to worry about. The search for Katie went on for weeks, and her father was even suspected of shipping her off to a convent, but it was eventually concluded that she had simply been kidnapped, and that was that. That was the end of the investigation. Meanwhile, Jessie is searching for his next victim. In April 1874, he attempted to lure off a five-year-old boy called Harry Field, offering him money to take him to Vernon Street, pretending to be lost. The two walked hand in hand down the street, but they ran into two teenagers who knew of Jesse and his crimes. They confronted him, and in the confrontation, Harry managed to escape and run away, and those two teens probably saved Harry's life. Around this same time, a family called the Millens had moved into the area, including four-year-old Horace Millen. Horace loved sweets, as any child does, and on the 22nd of April, his mother gave him some money to walk to the local bakery and get himself a treat. On his way there, he ran into an older boy, and being new to the area, little Horace and the Millens didn't know there was a predator that they needed to watch out for. Horace hadn't been warned. Jesse Pomeroy walked with Horace to the bakery where they shared a cake and then Jesse asked him if he wanted to walk to the local harbour. Horace happily agreed, he was excited for an adventure. And Jesse wasn't exactly sly about his crimes. Multiple people saw him and Horace walking together hand in hand through the marshland. And of course, Horace never came home. The two walked together for almost an hour until Jesse told Horace that they should rest for a minute. Then he pulled out his pocket knife and slashed the four-year-old's throat before stabbing him repeatedly until he died. Then Jesse made an attempt to castrate him. It was later that afternoon when a passerby came across his body, whilst Horace's family were searching frantically back in South Boston. 
Horace's body was sent to the coroner who issued a report to the media and the local police issued a bulletin to all stations to help identifying this child. It didn't take long for South Boston Precinct to get back to them with Horace's name and a potential suspect, the local teenager who liked to torture young boys. The South Boston police were ordered to pick Jesse up immediately and soon they found him at home, taking him into custody despite Ruth's protests. Jesse was taken to the station and was interrogated by six officers and at first he denied any knowledge of Horace's attack but he couldn't provide any solid alibi and his clothes gave everything away. He had marsh grass stuck to his shoes and a blood stain on his undershirt. He also had a cut on his face which he said was from shaving, but it was clear to medical examiners that Horace had put up a hell of a fight before he died. They asked Jesse if he owned a knife and he hesitated, but he did say yes, he did. An officer was sent to find it at his home and as expected, this knife was clogged with dirt and blood. This wasn't enough though, detectives needed solid evidence that Jesse was the perpetrator here. Because this wasn't just a case of torturing children anymore, this was murder, for which the sentence was the death sentence. There couldn't be any question about Jesse's involvement in this crime if he was going to go to trial. Leading up to the spot where Horace's body had been found, there had been two sets of footprints, one big and one small. Using plaster of Paris, they made casts of the footprints and compared them to the shoes of Jesse Pomeroy. And what would you guess? It was a perfect match. Jesse was arrested, but continued denying his involvement. The police captain, Henry Dyer, said to Jesse that if he were innocent, he wouldn't mind going to the undertakers to view Horace's body, would he? When they got there, face to face with the child's body, Jesse broke down. I'm sorry I did it, please don't tell my mother. It's fascinating to me that his biggest concern was his mother. It seems that he didn't have any idea how serious a crime this was despite being 13 years old. His biggest concern was getting in trouble with Ruth or disappointing her. He wasn't necessarily sorry that he'd killed this young boy. He told Captain Dyer to put him somewhere where he could no longer do such things. You might be able to imagine, the media had a field day with all this, splashing details of the boy fiend across their front pages. This was the time before innocent until proven guilty. Jesse's guilt was assumed from day one before any trial took place. Interestingly, when Jesse was arraigned in front of a judge on the 1st of May, he denied his previous confession completely and ended up pleading not guilty. Just one month later, he was indicted for first degree murder, for which the sentence was always the death sentence by hanging. Interestingly, when Jesse was arraigned in front of a judge on the 1st of May, he denied all his previous confessions and ended up pleading not guilty. Just one month later, he was indicted for first degree murder, for which the sentence was always the death sentence by hanging. However, questions arose around the ethics of such a thing, especially as Jesse was still a child himself. He was only 13 years old, 14 by the time the trial came around. Was the death penalty really the best course of action here? But we'll spin back round to that question in a moment. With Jesse sat in jail awaiting trial, Ruth Pomeroy is struggling. She's shunned by the local community for her son's crime and people just stop coming to her shop, causing her to close it. I mean, she was in complete denial and was trying to convince everyone that he was innocent, which didn't really help her case. With Ruth's shop going under, another local shop thrived, so much so they had to expand. In the expansion, they had to go in and clear out the basement of Ruth Pomeroy's shop, and in doing so, the remains of Katie Curran were finally found. Considering where she'd been found, there was now little question over who had murdered her, and it had been a brutal murder at that. And Jesse, of course, denied all involvement. It was only when the officers threatened that his mother and brother would be going down for the crime if he didn't confess did Jesse finally admit that he'd done it. When asked why, he said that he just wanted to see how she would act. So now he was charged with two first degree murders. I do want to mention here that some reports say that he confessed to the murder of Katie Curran first and then they found her body on the back of that. So the story I just told about an expansion into the basement might not be entirely accurate. That's the problem with historical cases, a lot of things just get lost over the years. But regardless, they found Katie's body, Jesse denied it, basically. 
In December 1874, Jessie is now 14 years old and the trial for the first degree murder of Horace Millen begins. They attempt to go for the insanity defence, which was going to be basically the only thing that could save him from the gallows, but the defence back then was just as precarious as it is now. It's difficult to prove genuine insanity, especially because so many people just pretend to save themselves from the death penalty. But for Jesse Pomeroy to clearly get so much enjoyment out of harming other children, for him to repeatedly offend, to progress from torture to actual murder, that has to be a sign of genuine insanity, right? Or just some severe form of mental illness. The distinction with the insanity plea though, at its most basic form, is awareness. Was Jesse aware of his actions? Did he know what he was doing and did he choose to do it? Well, yes. He was also now 14 years old, which is the age of criminal responsibility for murder in Massachusetts nowadays. At that age, you're considered to be old enough to know that murder is wrong. All in all, two psychiatrists for the defence and one for the prosecution interview Jesse. 14 different interviews over the course of many, many hours. Jesse told one doctor about how a sudden impulse or feeling would come over him that would cause him to commit these crimes. He'd say he experienced a sharp pain in the left side of his head that passed over to the right and then back again, which prompted him to act out in violence. He freely confessed to the crimes in these interviews until he said he started to hear a voice in his head telling him to defend himself because he was innocent. So once he decided he was innocent again, after a lot of flip-flopping, there was nothing that could change his mind. He pretty much took that stance for the rest of his life. One doctor who got closest to Jesse said that Jesse showed no pity for his victims, no remorse or sorrow. He would always be a threat to society and he was able to discriminate between right and wrong. In his opinion, Jesse was insane. I mean, the facts of this case were never in dispute. It was always clear that Jesse had committed these crimes despite him protesting his innocence. The question was more whether or not he deserved the death penalty, both based on the insanity plea and the fact he was a child, and there's never a clear answer. I mean, the insanity defence didn't really work at his trial, the details of his crimes were so vivid, so awful, that there was no way that the jury of 12 men would ever have been able to remain impartial and acquit him, no matter how insane he was. The trial came to a close just three days after it had begun, and after closing arguments, the jury went to deliberate, and after just five hours, they came back with a verdict. Guilty of first degree murder, which is premeditated murder. Death by hanging was the mandatory sentence in the state at this time for first degree murder. However, the jurors requested clemency based on Jesse's age. The judge was bound by the law to put forward the mandatory death sentence in this case, but it did need to be signed off by the governor before it could go ahead. That's Governor William Gaston. And luckily for Jesse, William Gaston was torn. Could he really send a child to death? Not really knowing what to do, he was very, very, very torn. He appointed a committee to study the question and report back, but that came back divided, so it was no help. So then Gaston held a public hearing to get the thoughts of the local community, after which he said he was going to go away and think on the topic. As you can imagine, this really angered people who were itching for Jesse's death, especially the families of his victims. So eventually, William calls back the committee again, who vote 5-4 to, to let the death sentence stand. But William just can't bring himself to do it. Eventually, he decides not to sign the death warrant, and this actually cost him his re-election, and another man called Alexander Rice was then elected as governor, and a couple of years later, he called another committee to ponder on the case once more. Because whilst he hadn't been given the death penalty, there was no actual sentence given to him. This was two years on by this point, people were a lot less angry, and it was decided then that Jesse's death sentence was to be commuted to a life sentence in solitary confinement and hard labour. A punishment that I would personally say is worse than death. So by this point, Jesse had been at the state prison in Charlestown for a couple of years when he was transferred to solitary confinement, where he would spend the next four decades alone, apart from his guards. It must have been mind-numbing. If Jesse wasn't insane before this, he sure would have been after a couple of years. 
With nothing else to fill his time, Jesse turned his mind to escape and over the coming years would make multiple attempts to get out. As I said, he was originally sentenced to hard labour, but this wouldn't work out because the guards found that Jesse was able to fashion tools out of just about anything, and these are tools for escape. His later obituary in the Appleton Post Crescent reads, Saws made from scraps of steel, from the left of a cot and from cans. Drills fashioned from screws and pieces of scrap metal. Files and knives are products of his ingenuity. With these, he made at least 12 attempts to escape. Eventually it got to a point where he was given only food and books, but still he managed to fashion tools out of them. In one of his escape attempts, he tunnelled with a nail, an improvised chisel and a homemade file to within just a few inches of freedom when a trail of lime dust exposed his attempt. Another time he cut an opening through his cell door, rigged a conductor from a gas jet into his cell and ignited the gas in the hope of burning a hole in the wall. Instead he just burned himself badly. His last attempt to escape was in 1912 when he sawed three bars from his cell, fitted dummies in their places to cover his activities and then when ready for the dash, slipped through the hole and was creeping along the corridor towards the guards when he accidentally woke up a cat who yowled. The guard found him armed with a dagger and equipped with a file and three saws. All of his attempts to escape were obviously unsuccessful and Jesse remained alone for 41 years. He made frequent efforts to obtain a pardon, petitioning governor after governor for clemency, but it was never granted. In 1917, his sentence was finally relaxed due to good behaviour and he was finally allowed to attend religious services and the evening entertainment in the prison. The governor said that he was a reformed man for real this time. In his time in jail, he'd learned a number of languages, he wrote poetry, he educated himself. During the war, he sold war bonds from prison and in 1923, he speculated in stocks. But over the next decade, his health would begin to fail and in 1930, he was transferred to a more liberal state farm prison in Bridgewater to live out the final few years of his life. He actually didn't want to be transferred away because Charlestown Prison had been his home for so many decades. He'd made friends since being released from solitary confinement. He didn't know anything else other than these walls but it was done anyway. When they moved him, they actually found a load of knives, saws and files in his cell, items that he collected over the years but never really used. Jesse Pomeroy hadn't left Charlestown Prison since he was 14 years old and he was now in his 70s. It was 1930 and the world had changed beyond recognition. The journey to the state farm was the only time he ever took a trip in a car and he commented on the lack of horses on the roads. He marvelled at seeing an elevated train and the officers stopped at an ice cream shop on the way. That would be the first and only time he would ever try an ice cream cone. Imagine how disconcerting it must be to enter prison with the world one way and leave to a completely different one. He was there through the Spanish influenza pandemic, through World War I, the whole world changed. Just two years later, after being transferred, Jesse Pomeroy died on Thursday 29th September 1934. The superintendent said that the cause of death was heart disease. And that ended his tale. He was a child killer who was just a child himself. Many believe that he did have more than just his two victims, making him a legitimate serial killer. Others don't believe that, and I suppose there's no way of knowing anymore. Some people are just born with a proclivity towards violence. Maybe Jesse never had a chance at living a normal life. Perhaps his brain was just wired wrong. But perhaps it was the violence of his childhood, the beatings from his father that led to something snapping, that led to the deaths and trauma of so many children and their parents. Again, there's no way to know the answer now. I'm very intrigued to know in this case if you think Jesse should have received the death penalty or not. I do see why the governor hesitated because can you really send a child to death? I mean even now they say the brains of men especially aren't fully formed till they're in their mid-twenties. Jesse was just 14 but was he just going to get more and more violent with age? Was he going to grow out of it? We don't know. Let me know what you think. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.